my comic shop closed seven years ago, but along my journey, I've met other stores with colorful communities all their own. One of those is Acme Comics in Greensboro, North Carolina, owned by Jermaine Exum, a.k.a. the Enigmatic Lord Retail. Now, I am speaking with the man himself in the definitive Lord Retail interview series. This is Volume 2 of Their Comic Shop History. Welcome to the Once and Future Lord Retail, a My Comic Shop History trilogy event. I am your host, Anthony Desiato. Joining me for Part 2, as always, is the owner of Acme Comics in Greensboro, North Carolina, Lord Retail himself, Jermaine Exum. Welcome back. Hello. I feel like I never left. I feel like I never left. People might think that we were recording these together, and that was actually the original plan, but we jettisoned that, and we've actually been recording these essentially monthly in real time, actually very close to the time that people are hearing this. So it has been, I mean, I know you say it feels like we've just been doing this, but it's been a little while, been a few weeks. I prefer, you know, taking some time between recordings because, I don't know, you're, you're getting some different version of me right now than perhaps you got of uh, that first conversation. That's very true. You know, I'm curious because, I'll be honest, I don't know that I necessarily really heard much feedback on our first episode one way or the other, you know, and I was curious if you heard from folks in your, in your world in your Acme community or beyond, uh, after part one, I was just curious if you heard anything. It's hard to say because sometimes, you know, given that it's like, sometimes a person will simply say, yeah, I heard the episode, but then sometimes because I guess I don't want to say we're talking about like you know, deeply personal matters. That's not really what it is. I guess but sometimes I don't know if people let me know that they've uh, taken in uh, uh, the content. I know that as far as our own store podcast, which is a little behind, it's a lot behind, but you know, we intend to get it rolling again soon. And some people are just catching up on the episode in which, uh, in which case Ben uh, has departed and moved to uh, Richmond, Virginia. So uh, he's not in the store on a regular basis. And there's a, Eastern amount of people like, oh, I didn't know that. I was wondering where he was. I think people are just getting caught up on things. Yeah, that could very well be. And I know certainly with my comic shop history, you know, we've had long breaks between seasons. And even this event that we're doing now is monthly, which, you know, in podcast terms, I think most shows that you see out there are, are weekly or maybe biweekly. So, you know, maybe there's not the same level of momentum, but, you know, the episodes are here and they'll remain out there for people to hopefully come to uh, in, in the months and years to come. It's funny, though, because I think I've been a little spoiled doing my Superman show, Digging for Kryptonite, because there, you know, we're talking about stories, we're talking about comics and movies and TV shows that people have opinions about and feelings about. And so uh, I find that I tend to hear more from that audience. Like I used to hear more from the My Comic Shop History audience in general. Like it has it has gotten a little quieter, maybe for those reasons that I just said. But even even considering all of that, with the Superman show, again, it's just like I, I tend to hear from people more like, oh, I, I like this, I dislike that, as they're sharing their takes on what we're covering. So it's just a little bit different. Yeah, I, even I'm a little bit behind on your Superman uh, podcast, a.k.a. the Kenny Braverman show. I'm a little behind on that one, the <laughs> Conduit show. I've mentioned I've mentioned Conduit a few times when you when you do catch up uh, because I finally now put out the episode where I finally reread and talked about those those Conduit storylines from the 90s. I think they were better in my memory. Uh, I think that's that's fair to say, but it's OK. I know they were. Yeah. Well, listen, that's cool, though. I mean, he I think he had what one action figure like they really tried with that character. They really tried put him put him out there among the pantheon creating a new supervillain for Superman that last is tough. It's just hard to do. It's easier to do for Batman, you know, Bane, Scarface, Hush. But as far as Superman, that's tough to put a new one out there that catches. It's true. I still, I maintain, and, you know, people can go listen to those episodes of Digging for Kryptonite if they want the full take. But I think there's a, I still maintain that there's potential there that hasn't been fully realized. And maybe that, you know, will change in the future. We'll see. But look, on the note of Superman and Digging for Kryptonite, you were on the show uh, within this past year, we did an episode on the Bendis Superman run. Yes, we did, which was, uh, what, what do they call it? A, uh, I was trying to think in, in wrestling terms where the, uh, it's a, uh, I got squashed, you know, I got, I got, uh, completely squashed on that one. Cause you were not having it. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> 
what is this you about? Not having it. But what is this about getting squashed? What do you mean? Because I wanted to bring this up because you've, I think at least via text and maybe off mic after we did our first recording, you you like you've made comments about wanting to talk about that episode, and I'm like, what? What does he want us? Like, what was there? Like, what happened? Like, what? Yeah, what nothing, did you want to talk nothing, about? Nothing really happened, but it just uh, I tried to make a convincing case, and it just seemed like a. Uh, you weren't up for it, and, and people in the comments weren't up for it, and it was uh, it was all torches and pitchforks, and I was in the windmill. So, okay, all right, Let, I'm glad we're talking about this, <laughs> and I feel like this ties into everything that that we have been talking about when it comes to Lord Retail. So, if anyone's like, "Why are you talking about this episode of another podcast?" It, it all ties in. So, crossover. You know, I make a point of this, and I, recently on Facebook, I put out like my mission statement about, you know, trying to be positive about things. And for the most part, I mean, I really do try to, but I'm also honest. I mean, in in my defense, there was there was a fair amount of of things that I liked about the Bendis run. And I said this on the show, like I liked his characterization of Clark. I liked his use of Clark's narration. I, I enjoyed hearing Clark's voice. I just really had some fundamental disagreements with story choices. It wasn't like oh, Ben just can't write a story. Like, that's not what, you know, that wasn't my, that wasn't my critique. I just had some real fundamental disagreements with certain choices that were made. Now, to your point, I know in the comments and online generally, you know, it doesn't seem to be a run that's beloved. <laughs> uh, so, so I understand if you sort of felt like you were, uh, you know, you were uh, alone there trying to mount this defense. I'm just saying other Superman episodes, the, uh, the, the, the jury wasn't quite as critical to begin with. Yeah. Well, on, on other, you know, Superman episodes of, of yours. Just saying, just saying. But, you know, I, I totally get it. You know, it was, uh, he inherited jor and he could have put him away instantly, but he didn't do that. He kind of kept the character out there for a bit. But overall, I don't know, it was a fresh take on Superman. Like, especially the artwork. You know, especially the artwork was, was outstanding. It was really excited about superman again when i kind of hadn't been for a good long while no good that's while. that's fair enough well it's like <laughs> as i was thinking about this uh i guess when i think back to that episode that we did i i enjoyed it very much and i appreciated getting your time and your perspective and i think it's a great episode that we put out i think and this ties into this whole thing about lord retail being cryptic because you did defend the run but I kind of felt as we were doing it, and listen, I could be to like I could be totally wrong here. I don't know what's inside your head and your heart. I don't know, but I felt like you were defending it more from this like how do I put this this this, like, <laughs> this place of what <laughs> no like this more dispassionate like third party defender role like I, I, we got to the end of the episode and i even said to you like did you actually like this run because again i felt like you were defending it a lot but it just didn't feel like it was a defense from someone who loved it it felt like it was someone who was defending it but i didn't know like if i really could tell where it was coming from and look as i said like i know you have a friendship with ben so part of me was like i don't know does he just not want to say anything because ben, you know, ben is might listen to this at some point is it that you know, he owns a store where he sells these books and he's like, he doesn't want to trash them because he wants people to buy them. It's like, I don't know. Oh, no. Like, if you were to ask me, I'm the one person on the planet that doesn't like the Hush story. I will. I take a hammer to it from, you know, monthly basis, new releases. I took a hammer to Hush. So, you know, next time, uh, I don't know if you already talked about that storyline or not, but if you want to get me on for a, a Hush episode, then I will surgically strike that story because i feel like it's not good it's quote unquote not good all right i did do an episode oh. of a show called my comic shop book club uh I don't know, two years ago almost now uh so i have covered it fairly recently i don't i don't know that i would necessarily cover it again on the superman show obviously superman plays a role yeah, in yeah. it so there's a way in if i if i wanted to uh and of course we are coming up on a milestone anniversary so we'll, we'll see maybe but I was genuinely excited about that Superman story. I thought it was a breath of fresh air after a period of extended lull of interest in Superman. But that's a whole other conversation where I have watched requests for Superman content reduce and dwindle over the years here. You know, that, and that's a whole other story about why I believe that is. But if someone does specifically ask for Superman, as far as what's in print and available, what's on the shelves, then 
I'm probably still going to suggest the, uh, you know, bend this main of steel and see how far they get. Now, I might not, if they're super into it, no pun intended, then I might do the Action Comics run. But if they just want a good Superman story, a beginning, middle, the end, exit, then I think I'm still going to go for that one. As far as, like, something current, you know, not All-Star Superman, Kingdom Come, like the basics. If somebody's already done that stuff, then I think I'm still going to go go for those. As far as what's in print and available, I know that you know there's a, a ton of great stories, but are they around right now? Might not be. Right. All right. Bold pick. Bold pick. But it's, it's what, so, and I feel like we probably already even talked about this on the other show. But when you do make that recommendation, do you find people do receive it well? Like, do they come back and they're like, hey, that was awesome. Like, I want the rest of this. Or do you um, never see them again? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, sometimes it happens and sometimes you've done a, you've had a great interaction with a person, you, you recommended some things. They're up for it, and it sits on their nightstand for X number of months. You don't really know what's happened, although sometimes that person comes back the next day, and you absolutely know that connected, and they had the bandwidth to take it in. That's kind of, you know, in today's world, we're so bombarded with everything that you blink, and like a whole week has passed. You blinked, and we're in the middle of October somehow. It's, you know, X number of days until the holidays. And it's like, how did this happen? Because that's just a... I don't know if it will ever slow down. You know, they say that when you're like when you're younger, when you're a kid, the day is like super long and summer vacation is like endless. Whereas now it just seems like the day is about four hours long. It is, it is certainly, it is a lot to sort of to, to manage and navigate. And, you know, I, I experienced that certainly as a consumer of this stuff. And then also as someone who puts, puts things out there, right? All these podcasts and everything. And it's like, I know there are so many podcasts from so many people on every conceivable subject within the comic book community alone for, you know, <laughs> forget about everything else. So that's why I'm always especially appreciative when anyone takes the time to listen to any of these things. Cause I, you know, I, I know there's, I know there's a lot now speaking of content that's out there and going back to a, a point you just made about availability of, of certain things. Uh, you know, for the most part, I'm not looking, I don't want to date these episodes so much, but there is something that is like sort of breaking news, you know, within the past couple of weeks. It's comics, so you kind of have to just talking about certain things. You are dating it. Yeah, it's true. And but I also feel like this sort of this speaks to a larger question that is is more perennial. So I I, I want to bring it up. And we had texted about this. So you know, people are hearing this. Hopefully, if they're listening when it when it's first coming out, late October, at the beginning of this month, we had New York Comic Con, and uh, one of the things that was announced was a new tier uh, within the DC Universe Infinite uh, Comics Reader app. And this new ultra tier, as it's called, which is now available for people to, to sign up, uh, they're promising an expanded library of material. Uh, as of this recording, we don't know exactly what that will be. But for me, at least, the headline was that members of this ultra tier can now read new release comics only 30 days after they come out in print, where previously, and if you remain a non-Ultra member of the DC app, if you just stay at the regular membership level, you wait six months. And of course, Marvel's at three months. Uh, I'm just curious what your, and I don't, I don't say this from a doom and gloom perspective, because that's not the way I view this at all, but I'm just curious like what your initial reaction to that was. I guess my initial reaction, just based upon the state of DC Comics right now, State of DC Comics is that they offer four monthly titles that are not Batman related or miniseries. Think about that for a second. DC Comics offers four series monthly Wonder Woman Flash, Superman Action. That's what they have that's not a miniseries or Batman related directly. Think of all the characters that exist, that's what they have for you. So let me preface, you know, what I'm about to say with that detail. DC Comics, something weird's going on there and has been for a while. So it just seemed to me that this was a latest, uh, please look at our stuff, slash whoever they answered to on a corporate level, we just did something. Look what we just did. We just did this. That's what it kind of looked like to me. 
So I don't, uh, as a retailer, I'm not particularly any more worried about it than I had been in the past because we're very lucky here that people really want the comics to turn the pages themselves, to have something on their bookshelf they can refer to because, you know, digitally, as I understand it, you are, are you still renting the book? Meaning that, you know, if the server goes down or if the service is no longer available, that, you know, you may lose access to your library that you built. There's that aspect of it. Um, something has been happening more and more recently here that I think is fantastic and I love it is there are kids, say, under 21, that will say, I read this online. I really want to have an actual copy of it. It's been happening a lot more frequently, and that's a great thing because certain stories... Like, I can't imagine what it would be like to take in Kingdom Come in a digital format. That's a completely different experience uh, than what I know it to be. If that was the only way I'd ever seen that story. Is it less? Is it more? I don't know, but it's different for sure. No, fair enough. And and that's why I, I preface that by saying, you know, I, I don't I don't come at this from a you know, this is this is terrible for retailers sort of thing. Because, you know, we've we've talked about this, right? Uh the fact that it you know, digital comics and print comics serve different audiences largely, you know, with some overlap, but if anything, it seems like there is that, or at least there can be that crossover where someone samples digitally and then they come into the shop. Uh, and digital comics are the modern day spinner rack, you know, where I would go into a convenience store as often as I could and buy whatever I didn't already have, which meant that I was taking in all sorts of fresh stuff. Now comics are available digitally Marvel Comics says, here, have 80,000 comic books at your disposal. It's like, well, I don't know which ones I want. So maybe you sample a few things, but then you do eventually say, okay, this was cool. I want to go actually see what these books were. So I think it remains that. It's a way that people are introduced to comics. And I know there's regions where space is just not an option. You know, New York, Chicago, places like that where you can't really, you know, set up. 50 long boxes of your lifelong collection. You just can't do it that way. But I still think that there's a draw back to the comic book store. There was a person in this weekend, uh, we had a signing with uh, Jason Hurley and Jeremy Hahn for the approach. And a friend of theirs came in who had primarily been doing mail order, et cetera, et cetera. And he just hadn't been in a comic book store in a while. And he really liked the, the energy that was going on and, and just, being a part of something happening in a store that he hadn't been a part of that in a while. I think that's an aspect of the comic book hobby. It can be very, comics can be an isolated thing where it's just you and you don't think anybody else likes the same stuff you do, or you can kind of be part of a community, even if it's just you being in the same room with people that like the same stuff you do. No, absolutely. It's, it's funny because I guess my, my perspective on a lot of this has, has changed uh, where surprisingly and surprisingly because if i go back to you know a few years ago you know I, I didn't read digitally at all and now i i do and it's i would say space is probably the biggest factor for me because i can't store this stuff uh you know if i if i keep going there's also and maybe other collectors out here will identify with this uh, you know it's always been tough for me from when i was a kid man like deciding what to keep in my collection. And I mean, I guess they just keep everything, but you know, space becomes a factor. And it's also, I don't know, like I've just always had this mentality of, uh, of, of needing to prune the collection and really only keep the stuff that I, I have the most attachment to, or I think is most, most worthy of it. But you know, I've gone back and forth over I mean, there's been stuff that I've gotten rid of and then I've rebought and it drives me nuts. I do the same thing as well. You know, I, I try to, confine myself to a certain number of boxes and no further. I recently added about nine boxes to that number. So it has grown a little bit, but in the process I'm trying to, I'm finally in a position where I can kind of interact with my collection again. And I'm kind of, I'm trying to go through it and see what's in there because I do keep my stuff in alphabetical numerical order. I was filing it the same way it was done at the store for ease of customers finding things until I realized that makes no sense to do my personal stuff that way at home. I can do whatever I want to do, but I equally will look through, see if there's anything that I just don't like anymore. Maybe I liked it at the time. Maybe I don't like it now. Occasionally, and this is rare, 
there'll be a, a, a creator that, you know, something's going on where I'm like, you know what? I don't know. You got to separate the art from the artist, but I don't know if I still want these books or not. But from time to time, I will, I'm doing that right now, going through to see if there's anything that I don't care for. Sometimes I will have made a mistake. Like I got rid of the majority of BPRD because that's a lot of books. That's a lot of comics, but I've recently reconnected and actually paid attention to what was going on in those books. And it's just mind blowing what goes on in those books. If you're a Hellboy fan, a lot of Hellboy fans don't actually read the BPRD series and don't know what was in there. The story was in there. The story of Hellboy, even though he wasn't present was in those books. So I'm kind of re-energized about that again, but I don't have those comics or the letters pages that were in them. And are you, are you, are you actually actively going to try to reclaim them? Um, they, they might be in the store somewhere because I think there was a part of me that was like, I don't know, maybe I might change my mind. Let me scroll these away somewhere. I feel like I saw, I I rediscovered them recently and I hid them again, but I don't know. (laughs) I don't know if they're still here or not, but there was some part of me that knew that wasn't the right call. Gotcha. Uh, that's the thing. I just, I got to the point where I don't, I really don't like that pruning process. Like I find it too, like it's, it's stressful and I find I, like I spend too much time on it. So that's another, another way in which digital has worked for me because it's like, to your point, it's like, no, I don't own them. You know, especially on the DC app, I subscribe, I can read what is available through the subscription. If DC ever shuts it all down or they remove things from it, that's it. I mean, you, there is an option to download. Uh, I've not used it, but I think it's, I think it's just sort of like a temporary thing a la Amazon prime videos, right? Like where you can, you can download. Um, but, but I think it's for a finite period of time. I'm not, I'm not positive. Uh, now, if I really, really like a story and in theory, if I have it at all, I must've liked it to some degree, but if I really, really like a story, like say lock and key, for example, I've got the issues. I've got the soft covers. I've got the hard covers. I've got like the, uh, you know, I really go all in with the double dip. If it's the thing I really like. It sounds like it. <laughs> well, that's good. No, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And again, I'm glad that, you know, when you hear news about, for example, the DC ultra business, that that's not something that, you know, necess- you know, causes a- alarm, which is good. And, and kind of on that note, I mean, I feel like, you know, certainly in the time that I've been doing this podcast and, and, you know, ma- making the documentary and things like that, you know, certain things have come up that seem to cause retailers alarm or, or just seem to make people think that they're causing retailers alarm. Like you see the headline. You have no idea what causes retailers alarm. It, it is, you, you name it. Someone is up in arms about it. But uh, this particular move, from my point of view, it seems like it's not for the benefit of the clientele and the, the, the citizens of the world so much as, look, we're doing something. We're selling something. See? Right. That's well, what I, that move seems like to me. Well, like DC spin, uh, I, I think was that, you know, we just, we're, we want to be everywhere. Like we're in the comic shops with you, you know, on Tuesdays, I guess now, uh, like we're with you in the Not comic here. shops. <laughs> now you still put everything out on Wednesday, right? Yeah, definitely Wednesday. I was like, we're with you in the comic shops on new comic day and, and we're online 30 days later. And we're like, that was sort of their way of, of, of framing it. But, you know, again, other things that sort of come to mind that I know have, been a source or perceived source of consternation for retailers. You know, I mean, digital comics initially, right? The fact that, that comics were even going to be available in, in this way, uh, available yeah. the same day, like to purchase through Comixology. Um, I was at a retailer comics prep meeting with Dan Didio and Jim Lee, I believe when they made that announcement and the room was hot. The room was hot. Again, torches, pitchforks. It was like, you know, classic uh, Frankenstein is what was going on. People were truly afraid for their uh, for their livelihood and considered it to be a betrayal of the utmost uh, degree. And, and but, here, but here we are, you know, it, it's fine. We're fine. Well, that's, and that's the thing, right? Like that wasn't a death knell. COVID, I know, obviously a massive challenge and I know not every store made it out of it, but uh, the other thing that I've said on this show, and even I think even more so in interviews, because I was promoting my comic shop country at the same time that everything. Are you all right over there? You, <laughs> you keep. Uh, I keep seeing you like uh, searching around. Is everything all right? Well, I'm. Um, 
I'm, I'm where I'm sitting now is kind of my workstation, which is right by the window. So I can see cars pass. I can see people right. walking by, you know? All right. I don't know if I'm boring you. Like I got other places to be, wrap it up. No, no, not at, all. <laughs> not at all. It's just, you know, I see, I see movement. Of course I'm going to, you know, no, fair enough. Uh, but anyway, you know, whether it's digital comics initially or, or with this recent announcement, the pandemic, uh, DC being in Walmart, I remember, you know, people were up in arms about, about that, that whole idea. And anyway, none of these things have been the death knell for the comics retail industry. Stores have endured, stores have found new ways to do what they do. I guess my question is, and again, I don't, I really don't mean to sort of, you know, swerve into this, uh, you know, doom and gloom scenario here, but is there anything from your perspective that you do consider to be this existential threat, you know, now or down the line to what it is you do? Or do you just sort of take it more as like, okay, we have, you know, it's a variety of challenges, like some big, some small, but we are able to weather and, and pivot. I mean, how do you view it? Is there anything that's like, that actually truly does cause you alarm? We try to, you know, roll with the punches and there's going to be punches, but there's a lot of, you know, what I call the call came from inside the house, meaning that it wasn't like an outside thing, like, like, uh, of the pandemic it wasn't something like that it was like is an internal like thing from perhaps a publisher partner or, or something you know distribution i think distribution right now that's that's a thing right now hold you know, that thought let's I, I, I that was one of the things i wanted to ask you about let's take a quick commercial break and then i want to ask you about that so we will be right back Acme Comics is a locally owned and operated full-service comic book store in Greensboro, North Carolina, for people of all ages and walks of life. Since 1983, this nine-time Eisner Award nominee uses their collective knowledge and resources to connect you with the best material available. They pride themselves on their significant contemporary and vintage back-issue selection. Mail order subscriptions to new releases are available, and all offerings are available to anyone, anywhere, via mail order. Follow Acme on social media and eBay. Listen to the Acme cast on all podcast services and visit acmecomics.com for much more. Film lovers and filmmakers should check out this family of film festivals. Brightside Tavern in Jersey City, Hang On to Your Shorts in Asbury Park, Point Lookout on Long Island, and In the Cut in Bloomfield, New Jersey. I was fortunate enough to have my work shown at these festivals and I found them to be very enjoyable and well-run events. Submission information for filmmakers, as well as details about the festivals generally, can be found at filmfreeway.com. Follow the festivals on social media for news and updates about events, discounts, tickets, and more. Also, be sure to listen to the Hang On To Your Shorts and Cullen On Film podcasts available via a shared universe network. Fat Moose Comics is New Jersey's best and oldest comic book store. Established in 1982 and currently under new ownership, Moose sells a wide selection of new and old comics from every publisher, action figures, graphic novels, posters, statues, and more. If you're looking for something and they don't have it, they can probably get it for you. They know a guy. Visit Fat Moose in Whippany the next time you're in the Garden State, and be sure to reach out via the Fat Moose Comics Facebook page. Flat Squirrel Productions is an affiliate of BCW Supplies. The next time you need to restock on comic book bags, boards, boxes, and more, be sure to use promo code FSP, that's FSP for Flat Squirrel Productions, to save 10% on your order, and it helps support the show. Thank you. All Yeah Comics celebrates and promotes everything that is wonderful about comics, toys, artwork, and the joy they bring to people. Visit them in person at one of their three locations, Harrison, New York, which happens to be my local comic shop, Skokie, Illinois, or Muncie, Indiana. If you have children and have been looking for a family-friendly store, look no further. Join All Yeah for exciting events, including creator signings, how-tos, and more. Visit AllYeahComics.com and follow All Yeah on social media for more. Their name says exactly how they feel about it. Aw Yeah! And we're back. Hey, before we talk about <laughs> distribution, you are one of, Acme Comics is one of the sponsors that, that people who listen to all of my podcasts hear a commercial for uh, in each episode. And I want to say, and I, you know, I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, and, you know, if I should, you know, sort of keep this behind the scenes, but I just think it's so interesting and it so speaks to everything that we're always talking about with respect to the community and what these stores can mean to people, because it's not just you. There are three shops who are sponsors of the podcast, but the shops themselves are not the ones 
you know, sort of fueling that. It, they were, you know, customers or other people affiliated with the stores who who purchased that uh, Patreon reward tier and gifted it to the stores. That to me is is so remarkable that that customers feel that strongly about these places that they buy them ads. It's beautiful. The power of a good comic book store is something that you know, multinational conglomerate uh, uh, corporations, they can't figure out how to do it. They can't figure out how to get that type of loyalty, brand loyalty. They don't know how to do it. But that good local comic book store, it does it all the time. It does it without thinking about it. So it's, it's just amazing. You know, they're mediocre stores. They're outright bad stores. They're outright bad stores. Um, we recently picked up a subscription from a customer who does not live in this state, he lives multiple States away, but he's visited us from time to time. And he has a, a, a longtime friend who is in this area and his store just seemed like they were going out of their way to inconvenience this customer on a regular basis. So we picked up his subscription for mail orders and we're going to take care of him. Fair so enough. it's a, uh, the, the, the good comic book store is a powerful thing. Yeah. Listen, I pre-ordered the uh, death of Superman 30th anniversary special through Acme comics. And Thank that's you. not a slight to, to my local shop at all, but it is a little bit of, you know, kind of wanting to spread the love. I ordered a hardcover through uh, Sean at fat moose. It's, 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 it's mostly that, but it's also now you really can't let me down because it, this hasn't ha like it hasn't come out. I haven't received it yet. So now I'm really going to build you up here. You don't let me down when this book comes out, but it's also driven by, it's like, you know, look, this is what's my start in comics. We're not having this conversation now. If, if not for death of Superman, this means the world. I know, to it me. means a lot to you. It means a lot to me. So I'm like, I ha like this has to be a slam dunk. Like I need to, I need to know that I am getting this. And I, I went to you, but here's the thing. What happens when we unpack those lunar boxes? We unpack that last box. It's not there. I what know. happens when, oh no, the corner of this box is completely destroyed. You know, to quote uh, Star Trek Generations, was anyone in there? What if that's the box? I know. I know. Superman uh, 75 in it. But, uh, you know, again, going back to distribution, I think that's one of the things that is not on the side of the health of the comic book store is distribution right now. You know, you've got Penguin Random House, which handles Marvel and, and other publishers as well. They simply are not equipped to safely transport single issue product. Their boxes cannot take the damage. Lately, as of the past two weeks, there are things simply absent. Or there are things where we got, I want to say, 120 extra copies of the wrong book and 120 copies short on Spider-Man number one. That's a new one for Penguin Random House to outright get something quantity-wise wrong. That's kind of a new one. And it took about, it took about two weeks to get more copies in. Two weeks without a Spider-Man number one. That's a thing. That's a credibility thing. That's a window of opportunity thing. Um, and you could still get Marvel material from Diamond. Their boxes are designed better to transport single issue material, but they have to buy from Penguin. So we're going to pay more. Diamond shipping, whatever their mystery math is on how they calculate shipping, remains unknown. But again, with Penguin, what good is free shipping if you didn't get the thing you asked for or it didn't arrive in sellable condition? Lunar, there's less problems with Lunar, but they're not invincible. You know, Lunar has no phone number. You can't call up your rep. You have to email and hope they get back to you. Um, and just when you think, okay, one, one of these three distributors is stabilized, one or two do with things. All right, we're going to move all of our stuff over to this one now. We can't take it anymore. We're going to move it all over to this one. Then that one does something weird. So it's just kind of, it's, it's frustrating in that it's more work. And the chances of something weird happening have increased. 
across our the three single issue distributors. I was cur- I'm sorry to hear that. I'm, I've been curious about that. Uh, obviously, this is you know really just within these past couple of years where again you know and, and like and that's the thing that's for for me you know my my entire experience w- working behind the counter and then you know through the podcast and the documentary was always in the context of diamond you got to go through diamond and now you have these other players so just just so i'm straight on this so dc comes from lunar and that's the only place you can get dc product if i'm not mistaken they're exclusive whereas you will still be able to order dark horse i think idw and marvel through diamond if you just don't want to have multiple accounts, if you are hopeful that Diamond can deliver the material in an undamaged manner, even though, you know, their systems, I'm pretty sure, are the same as they always were. But you hope that quality control is a little better across the board. You know, I, I had the idea the other day, and this will never happen, but what if there could be, from each publisher, their own quality control agent that was answerable to the publisher that could be on site at these distributors. I think that that changed a lot because there's no way that these publishers or even creators know what happens to their material on its way to the comic book store. Once it gets to the comic book store, how could they, why would they? But if they knew, I think if they saw what happened, if they knew the process, they'd, they'd want, they'd want some changes. You know, if, if you're, if you're a farmer and, you know, you, you, you are, are generating eggs or whatever, and your eggs are constantly arriving at the grocery store broken, so people can't really buy them, but you don't really know that part. That, that's a vulnerability. Yeah, no, that is a very interesting suggestion. I would be very curious, to, you know, if, <laughs> uh, if, if anything like that not only came to pass, but were just, you know, considered. I think that would be fascinating. Uh, so, again, so DC goes through Lunar Singles and Graphic Novels. Yes, singles and graphic novels. And then, so everything Marvel is Penguin Random House, or you could still get through Diamond, but you're paying more because they have to get it from Penguin. Yes, you're paying more per unit, and your shipping costs are unknowable and in play. And then, uh, as far as Image, IDW, like all these other publishers, are they still all just Diamond, or do they use... I I believe at the end of the year, IDW has moved over to Penguin, and I think that Dark Horse, equally, that's a thing. I think Dark Horse is moving over to Penguin as well, in which case I really hope that I'm sure Penguin says, you know, we're doing a great job with Marvel. We can definitely handle your product as well, because why wouldn't they? But when it comes down to logistics, there's some issues going on. You know, I cannot, if I'm using the Diamond system, I can see that last month I ordered 21 copies of just to pull something out of the air of uh, uh, Tron comics or 21 copies. I thought you were uh, going to pull a Batman comic because that's a safe bet. <laughs> I, I know. I don't know what, where Tron came from at all. But, uh, you know, 21 copies of Tron. This month I'm preparing to do a new order and I can see that last month I ordered 21 copies. How did it do? I can check it out. Do I need 25? Do I need 19 copies? But with, and, and Lunar, I can do the same thing. Penguin, I can't do that. And that goes both ways. Either I'm going to accidentally order too much because I don't really know without going through a lot of steps, a lot of steps, what was ordered previously, or I'm going to order too little, just arbitrarily, you know, cutting back, cutting back, cutting back. And that's not in service of the publisher, in my opinion. It's a simple thing. It can be done. They don't have that available yet. Yet. You know, they've had plenty of time to do that. Right. And, I, again, you know, I'm not looking for specific numbers here, but as far as the your co- like shipping aside, your cost through these distributors is it comparable to what it was when you were using Diamond? Or I know you're still using Diamond for some of the public. Is it, is it are no. they comparable to Diamond or no? No, it, it wasn't. Uh, retailers took a they, they took a uh, percentage hit in this process because of course they did. And as you know, margins are pretty narrow on you know, comics and collectibles. I, I sometimes will, you know, if, if a customer's talking to me that, that kind of knows their stuff and I'm speaking frankly, I'll say everything in this room had essentially had a shipping cost. Maybe not, you know, penguin stuff, but essentially stuff going back years, everything in this room we're looking at had a shipping cost. 
Did we offer a discount on top of it? Because that's kind of customary in our region. Probably. You know, if it's a, a subscription that meets a certain tier, then we probably you know, did that as a... Uh, discounts have just kind of always been a thing in this region. I know it's not so in all regions, but Southeast has kind of been a thing. Gotcha. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really tough. I, I mean, I have, I have more questions about this. I mean, one of them is, and remind me, were you using the diamond point of sale system? Yes, we do. And you still use it. How, how does that play out now with the multiple distributors? I mean, I guess you're still using it to scan the, the, the barcodes, right. And all of that. Yeah. Inventory is drawing down. And we have means of seeing how many copies remain, seeing what our margins are. Um, I want to say there was an action figure that came in that, uh, you know, if we were strictly going by Diamond's MSRP, we were making $7 off of that figure. It's, you know, that, that, that margin is not, because shipping isn't built into that margin at all. So it would be even less. So... You know, we kind of had to adjust upward just to remain uh, somewhat healthy. You know, not in an abusive way, but in a, this is what it costs. So we have to have some type of margin that's not, you know, 8% margin. The, the thing that's fascinating to me is, you know, all these years dealing with Diamond as a, you know, as, as an employee at a comic shop and then talking to other retailers I know it, it wasn't without its problems, you know, with the effective monopoly that it had for, for the time that it did. But I know that, you know, one of the, the arguments against multiple distributors is that essentially everything that you've just laid out with your current situation, right? That other distributors might not, might not really be built for something like this in terms of, again, being able to fulfill orders, being able to, to pack and ship properly. Now you're dealing with not just the diamond ordering system, but you're dealing with multiple systems. So that's time, time to learn it initially, and then time to fill those orders, you know, th three separate systems each time. Uh, again, I know you said with, with Penguin, it's, uh, you know, free shipping, but I guess, you know, in theory, one of the benefits when it was just diamond is like your, all of your orders are going through there, right? And the, the more, I mean, I don't know exactly how it was, it was structured before, but um, I don't like know. Right yeah. now, for example, I'm doing final order cutoff, which is one of two things. It's either your last opportunity to adjust the uh, initial orders, initial purchase orders that you made upward, downward. It's your last chance to change something. Or in certain cases, that's what I'm doing my initial order. I'm just doing it right on the final order cutoff line. I have to do three of those right. every week. I have to do it for Diamond. I have to do it for Lunar, which is always due on Sundays. Ideally, Monday is a good time because the store has seen what's happened over the weekend. But Lunar gives you till Sunday to get it done. A little arbitrary. And uh, Penguin Random House for Marvel Material due on Monday as well. So that's three separate, uh, separate things as opposed to one thing. And one of them has to be done by Sunday. So I will be, I'll be looking at that one uh, not long after we log off today. Gotcha. Yeah, I know it's, it's I, again, it's just, like I said, it's, it's interesting to hear all of this because I, I always heard it more from the perspective of the, the problems with diamond and with just diamond. But you know, now it's, you know, to see this play out with multiple distributors poses a whole new set of challenges. I mean, if you, if, if it were up to you, I mean, did, would you prefer to go back to the way it was before? Do you wish that it was still just diamond that you were dealing with? I think that there are ways to refine all of this if someone wanted to, but there seems to be no incentive to. The only thing I can think of is, is if somehow publishers in the hopes of selling more material want to refine some things that's all i can really think of um it has to come from publisher end to make things a little clearer a little easier a little smoother in the effort to sell more material as opposed to well we put it out there they order it or they don't which is kind of what it seems like is happening to me especially on the dc end it seems like there there's just some there's something I can't put my finger on what it is that's going on. 
You know, there's very little promotion of anything. Have you seen? Have you seen as a uh, on the consumer end of things and the fan end of things? Have you seen much about Batman Spawn? Has that been promoted in anything that you've looked at on on the on the DC app? Have you heard anything about that? McFarlane, Greg Capullo coming back for Batman Spawn too, like the event of, of the century. I feel like the main thing that I probably saw was a link to a Newsarama article on Facebook. Like that was that was probably what I what I saw. That's kind of what I mean. Like you're 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 plugged in. You're doing what you're supposed to. You're checking out DC content, you know, on on the app, but you're not really seeing stuff. That's kind of what I mean. Gotcha. Well, on a, maybe a happier note. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be a downer. It's just this is what it is, you know. No, I get I had it. A, there was someone I spoke to on Saturday. It was like super busy, and you know, because we're doing an event, and it was Halloween Comic Fest, which was a lot of fun. Sorry for dating it. And uh, he pulled me aside for a second, and he said, "You know, this is going to take a while." I'm like, fine. And he basically was talking about uh, his hometown store, which is a very small store, one by just one person who's getting older. And he was thinking about, you know, becoming a becoming a part of the business. I told him this is the worst possible time to be investing your time, your resources, and your finances into something like that as a as a novice. You know, even with decades of experience, there's stuff going on where I'm like, I'm not sure. I I don't this is beyond my experience. So I had to tell him that you've chosen the worst possible time to consider doing something like that and to please reconsider do a lot of research please reconsider uh you're i'm sure you have a far gentler touch than steve odo did or would uh rather he would take delight in shattering someone's dream that was mostly in the context of you know people brought stuff in to sell they thought it was worth a lot and he disabused them of that notion but it came up too in the context of people wanting to open a comic book store there were plenty who he talked out of it or tried to talk out of it there's still an aspect of, oh, wouldn't this be fun? And which that's fine, but retail is still retail. And I, I tell people this, they're like, oh, you get, you're living at your dream. And I'm like, yes, but retail is still retail, you know, profit margins, the general public, you know, taking their, their uh, baggage out on you sometimes. All that stuff is still part of this because it's still retail, regardless of what the product is. Retail is still retail, even especially when you're Lord Retail. That's how it goes. I'm going to put the T-shirt or something. I, I like that. You should. So, I, I, like I was saying, on a, on, a, on maybe a happier note, I saw uh, not long before we sat down to record, you put out on Twitter a, a call for questions. If there was anyone who who wanted to throw out a question for you that we could tackle on the podcast, did, did you get any bites? Nothing that I saw um, immediately. So I guess everybody knows everything that they want to know about me, and I can close the chapter on uh, <laughs> revealing any sort of uh, details. You so, know, for all this ask, talk ask. about how mysterious and cryptic you are, I would think that people would be like, oh, this is my chance. But no, they didn't. Asked and answered. But, uh, you know, I, I think on the last podcast we recorded, there was this thing I was trying to remember. And it doesn't entirely cover whatever's going on with me. I was watching a thing on Netflix called This Is Pop. It's about music. It's terribly interesting, you know, the presentation of it. But apparently there's a ton, an absolute ton of songs that were written coming out of, uh, uh, I think, Sweden in that region. But you don't know that. And I mean like you know, Britney Spears songs, like just pop music stuff that's been around us for so long. You assume that the singer wrote. I know that's what I usually assume, which is probably not the case most of the time. It did a ton of pop music songs over the decades going back to the 70s coming out of this area. But you don't really know that because I guess there's a uh, there's a term, and I actually wrote this down on my phone like when they talked about it, but I couldn't recall it when we talked. It's called Yantelagen, J-A-N-T-E-L-A-G-E-N, Yantelagen. And the short version of that is this mindset where – you're not really supposed to make a big deal out of stuff. You do the stuff, but you know, you're no more special than anybody else. You're doing the job, you're doing the thing. If it works out, that's great, but don't worry about where it came from. 
So I think there's a little bit of that in me. Obviously not entirely, but, and I'd never even heard of this word or knew of such a mindset at all, but it really seemed to kind of sum up something. But I think that if I can get past that, if I can shake that off, then I'll really be dangerous, right? (laughs) Then the real work begins. Well, you know, so a few things to follow up on. Well, number one, I am aware of of all the music coming out of Sweet. I mean, not all of it, but I'm aware that a lot of it does. And I think probably one of the things that really put that on my radar was the Backstreet Boys song, I Want It That Way. Because, yes, I had no clue. I Again, I assumed that those guys sat down and wrote the thing. No, and the lyrics make no sense. They I mean, never did. You know, that's the thing. And it's still, you know, one of the most popular songs. And that's the, that's the thing that's so funny. It's like, it's, it really, if you really listen to those lyrics, if you write them down and read them, like, it's not there. It, it doesn't make any sense. Half the time you want it that way. The other time you don't want it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and there's yep. even, they put out a corrected version of this. Like they, I don't know if this was, I th- if, if my Backstreet Boys memory is accurate, I think, uh, I think that they recorded both versions back in the day and then they went with the incorrect version and that was the right call because everyone loved but i think within the past few years they finally put out that corrected version where they re not not the boys themselves i don't think but like the lyrics were rewritten to make sense in english and like i listened to it and it's just like it's 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 right but it just feels wrong (laughs) wildly rejected yes (laughs) uh but no like I, i get what you're saying and i think that uh if though you call yourself Lord Retail, but like if you were out there, me, 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 and, and, and making it all about you, like, I don't know that we would be here. I mean, what's interesting to me is that there is this sort of air of mystery around you. And, but you know, the other thing too, cause we've, you and I specifically have talked about this and this has definitely come up in my conversations with retailers of, you know, for the, you know, customers don't know a lot about the behind the scenes of a store and all of the specific challenges, like all the stuff that we've always talked about. But there is this question that you and I specifically have talked about, how much should a customer know? Like how much should, and, and I guess it's different when we're doing a podcast about the comics industry, right? That's an opportunity to talk about it. But, you know, like a customer coming into the store, how much should you tell a customer? How much should a customer know? I mean, it is a valid question. I get what you're saying. And, you know, again, I don't mean to say to make it more about me, but I'm saying that through me, I could be representing the store in a more meaningful way than I have been, than I ever have been through me representing the store. I think that's a whole other thing. Um, It depends on, you know, what the customer is, is, what we're talking about, how closely connected we are, you know, if they've been around for a while. I might say simply, I don't want to make our problems your problems. However, keep in mind that when you're looking at issue number one, oh, cool. Issue number one, at that moment is where we're figuring out how many copies of three to get. So it really helps to hear, you know, from you pretty soon if you really like that book or not. Yeah. Now, I, I, as far as, you know, not making too big a deal out of things, I want to, that's actually a good segue to something that I wanted to, to bring up. So yeah, I know we've been talking about this idea of you being cryptic and I know we spent time on it in, in the last episode and probably every time that you're on the show. <laughs> but, and it, you know, it's funny, I guess that's, this stems from in particular, like when I was at the store and I filmed some of this of Austin, uh, your, your colleague at Acme and Chris Jerusso, the comic book artist who, you know, lives in Greensboro and, you know, they were kind of busting your chops about uh, you know how it's, sometimes it can be hard to get a straight answer out of Jermaine. And there's the moment in my comic shop country where I ask you how many copies of Action One Thousand did you order, and you're going on and on and on. And you never say the number, and we've talked about that. And I, you would because tribute, I couldn't remember because you couldn't remember. So okay, and, and I, I know we've. I don't know. I don't know that I said this specifically in the last. See, it's been a month. I don't remember exactly, but I think this is new, <laughs> new analysis. And also. Please no, I don't like I don't ever want this to feel like I'm psychoanalyzing you, but I just think it's so fascinating. So like I know you so I think it's fair to say that those around you perceive this level of 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 you being cryptic, right? Whether you intend to or not, there are those who feel like it's hard to get a straight answer out of Jermaine sometimes at least. I know you attribute it at least in part to, you know, I, I don't know as remember, right? Others maybe do do look at it as, you know, you're trying to create mystery, trying to build suspense, that sort of thing. My working theory, now having known you <laughs> for, for a bit, and just going back to what you're saying about not making a big deal, but I think I think you 
do put, and you could totally tell me if I'm right, but it could be totally off here. But I feel like you do place a high level of importance on, on a lot. Like, I don't think you've, you don't strike me as someone who takes much lightly or, or, you know, sort of just, you know, flies by the seat of your pants, especially in terms of, of what you're, what you're saying, what you're putting out there. Like, and here's a perfect example. So we're doing this multi-part podcast event. Earlier this year, I did a very similar type of event with Sean Hendricks from Fat Moose Comics. The level of behind the scenes discussion about what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, what we were going to talk about, who was going to participate. It was a night and day difference. With Sean, it was just like, oh yeah, like let me know what you want to do. <laughs> it's like, and we just like jumped into it. Whereas with us, like there was far more back and forth about what we were going to do. And I don't say that in a negative way, but it's just, you know, it's just different. So uh, I think like when I think of you, I, I, I think maybe in the past I did, I did chalk it up to more like, like he's trying to like, just like keep people engaged, <laughs> like keep build that suspense. But, nope. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I just feel like you just don't strike me as someone who, who does things or says things lightly. Like, do you feel like you, you do put a lot into, you know, in, into the, the words that you're putting out there, whether it's through a tweet or, or something like this, or even just a conversation at the shop? Like, am I, am I onto something here or, or, or not? Well, I, I try to, I do try to measure what I'm saying because words have power. They definitely do. Um, you know, I, I remember years ago, there was someone that, I guess we weren't getting along for, for some reason. And I said something to them, just, you know, sort of off the cuff about, you know, I guess like, you know, well, you're like this, you're like this, and you do that. And then I saw that person years later. I mean, like over 10 years later. And I guess whatever, whatever I said, it really stuck with them. And they'd been just like carrying that around in the back of their head. And I didn't remember what they were saying. And no, no memory of doing that at all. So I guess I do try, I try to, you know, measure my words carefully. And in some cases, I don't really know what the answer is, but I believe a person deserves some type of something, you know, even, even if I'm undecided. It's like, what do you want to do about this? I may not know on the spot what I want to do about that. I may not know. And it's not that I'm, you know, necessarily stalling for time. Maybe I'm just verbally working out what my thoughts are or just, you know, putting something out there as far as an answer. But I don't have the, I don't have the energy to, to, uh, you know, intentionally create a mystery of, <laughs> of that degree. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm good, but I'm not that good. So I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't feel like I'm doing a thing most of the time. Sometimes I do, you know, I know, like, okay, I heard what I just said, and that probably came out a certain way that, you know, checks a box, like, yeah, he did the thing, he said the thing, without actually saying anything. I might be doing it right now, but uh, I feel like I'm not doing that intentionally. Gotcha. Do, do sometimes I not want to be in the spotlight, so I'll try to, like, you know, move the spotlight off of me. I, I will definitely do that from time to time in hopefully a discreet manner, but, uh, I don't know. We're, you know, we're not here to talk about me, right? We are only here to talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I'm recording from, I have a little bit of a workstation. I don't have a desk yet. Maybe someday I'll have a desk in an office, but I'm at a workstation. It's kind of behind the counter near, near the front window of the store, which is why I'm I'm looking over because I can see cars passing. I can see people walking past. So I'm glancing over from time to time. But there was a point yesterday where a woman that was in here with uh, with their kid, I guess I was doing something over here. And she said, oh, good. You're a real person. So I don't know what she was looking at. Maybe she thought I was some sort of mannequin or some sort of display. <laughs> but she said, oh, good. You're a real person. In which case I said, well, how real or not real I am is up for debate, but uh, thank you for, for, for noticing. Can I help you find anything today? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you know, it was a very meta moment for me. You know, good. You're real. That's, am that's my life. Weird. That's amazing. Well, you know, it, I, I was, it was interesting to hear you talk about that, you know, uh, that, that time that you did say those things to that person and they held on to them. And I, cause I was curious, like if there have been moments where, 
you know, you ha maybe have spoken more freely and then it, you know, sort of came back to bite you. And then, you know, that kind of led to being a little bit more measured. Like, I, have you, have you, like, even as a kid, as a teenager, like when you were first starting to work at the store, w w were you like that then? Or is that something that sort of evolved more over time? I don't know. You'd have to talk to people who were around at the time. Speaking to of. To get that type of answer, because I, I, I don't really know. You know, in, in ways, I've, I've been here for so long, you know, and I, I don't know how many people can relate to being at the same job for, what is it, like 26, 27 years now? The same job, you know. And I was thinking about this the other day. I'm not, I feel like I'm not terribly different from how I was at 25 35 I passed 45 I feel like I'm not that different but the world around me and the people around me have changed so much you know people have gone on to you know have multiple careers or, or they they have you know families and whatnot but I feel like I, I'm somehow unchanged I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing hmm. You know, well, first of all, when you say, you know, talking to people who have known you for a long time, speaking of, I have an episode that I recorded with uh, Bob Milliken, who you put me in touch with, who, uh, you know, longstanding member of the the Acme crew. And uh, that episode is going to be out on my Patreon page, but for free. So anyone can listen to it. You'll just have to go to the Patreon page to get it. Uh, I will likely drop it next month when I release the final part of our trilogy, but just to give people a heads up about that. But you know, uh, you you reminded me of Rich Roney, the, the beloved elder statesman of, of the Alternate Realities crew. He's been at the same job since he graduated college, and he is now retirement age. So, you know, that that idea of staying one place, I agree, is, is increasingly rare. Um, he's the only person I can think of off the top of my head who uh, not just has done it, but like is still doing it. And... The same type of thing with Rich. I mean, and I, you know, when I have him on for the final run of episodes next year, by the way, in your tweet uh, where you were put out the call for questions, you prematurely uh, called the end of, of my comic shop history. <laughs> like we're doing the wrap up series for the best. Like, no, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> no, we still have, we have four very special quarterly episodes that will be coming out next year, part of an event called For All Seasons. Uh, and so, uh, once a quarter, I'll be sitting down with the, the, the innermost circle of the alternate realities crew to say goodbye to this podcast. So we have a very, very, very special farewell event coming up. Rich, good, good. I'm glad to hear it. Rich will be part of that. And so I can bring this up with him then, but like, we've talked about this uh, about Rich where he is probably the steadiest, most consistent presence within our community in terms of in terms of his efforts to keep in touch with everyone which we appreciate but also you know he's been at the same job he's you know uh you know he's never married or had kids like he's he's the same essentially as as when all of us first met him and you know like we, we've talked about this you know for us coming to the store you know through high school through college it's like rich was there and he's still there now and he's just been this constant presence and like we appreciate him so much for a lot of reasons but i think in part for for that steady presence as we have all changed so much and and he's just sort of been this uh like rock <laughs> throughout but how does he really feel about that though has he noticed it like i'd be i, I don't know if you even ask him that question how does he feel about that though yeah i i, I will ask him that i don't know that i'll i'll get much more of an answer than i would from you but i'll try <laughs> oh i i can tell you how i feel about it but i probably won't but uh you know ask him that question for me all right i will i will yeah is that so that's not so there but you do ha i mean I, I won't press you on this but like so there is like you do feel a certain way but it's not necessarily something necessarily something you would share that you would articulate now it, it just can be it, it can be a little disorienting sometimes you know, just literally sitting where I am right now, which is where Bob Milliken would have sat when I would have come in here in high school. And from time to time, I realize that's what's happening. Just think about that for a second. That I'm that I am sitting in the place where where he once sat as, as manager of the Lawndale location. 
You know, when I would go into the original Acme Comics in the downtown location, I remember, uh, I remember weird things. I remember he, I remember him being in there because he was like a shop guy, you know, before he started working there. And I guess I thought that he worked there. It, it's very, it's very surreal. It's very surreal. But there was a point where he did, you know, start to work there. The same as there was a point where I started to work here. It's a cyclical thing that was kind of going on before me. You know, there's several eras of this before me, many of which I just won't know anything about because there's no one to, there's no one to have contact with to, to tell those tales. As interesting and as exciting as my era was, and it was very different than any other era, you know, uh, but there was more to Acme Comics before I came around for sure. Gotcha. The the last the last question that I have on this note of of being cryptic, for lack of a better word, uh, and we can skip over this if it's not something you want to touch on. But I, I guess sometimes like, I give the real answer, you know, when I feel comfortable, and everybody stares at me. I'm like, well, this is why I don't tell you guys <laughs> stuff. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I've I've never seen ET before, and everybody like you know the the the, the record skips. Everybody looks at me. I'm like, I thought we were caring and sharing right now. The thing that I was curious about, and again, we, you know, we don't, we don't have to delve into this if you don't want to, but it, you know, it's one thing to talk about. Oh, he's cryptic when you know a filmmaker asks him how many copies of a book he ordered, right? And we can, you know, we joke about that. But I'm curious in your in your personal life, in you know, relationships with parents, with the romantic partner, with with friends, this sense of like, oh, it can be hard to get a straight answer out of Jermaine. Is that something that has? or you've perceived to be any kind of roadblock in, in those scenarios, is it present there? And if so, is it something that you've bumped up against? Whatever you imagine it to be, it's 10 times that okay. <laughs> as far as, you know, personal, personal life stuff. You can imagine, you know, how frustrating that could be if you're talking about something like legitimate, um, where I either just don't want to say how I feel about a thing, or I don't know how I feel about a thing. Yet there's the person, you know, on an answer at the time. Um, and I kind of figured out, I kind of figured out what, I figured out something and it's, it's for me to determine what to do about it. But it's like, I feel like the people that have gotten to know me the best are, have all dematerialized over the years. And I just, realized slash noticed that somewhat recently and that may be a subconscious thing which is why i just don't open up about much as far as personal stuff but i did notice that you know for better or for worse the people i felt knew me best not around gotcha again i give the real answer and now it's like oh the uh now what do you got oh, well is it that you feel like they're not around like because they didn't, you know, they, I don't know that they didn't get that clarity from you or just that they're not there. And that's why you're like, you're glad that you didn't say more. No, it just, and I'm not saying, I think it's probably for the best in most cases that that is. So the people that quote unquote knew me best are not around for different reasons, you know, but mentally I'm like, is that the reason why they're not around? Cause they did know me better than others is that it i don't know but i'm trying to work on that because that's probably not a thing it probably doesn't make sense well it's you know and, and again i don't i, you know, I don't want to turn this into a therapy session but you know it's like I wait you, no but it's like as you're saying that i mean i think about you know my relationship with my wife and you know there have you know it's funny because like there have been times where sometimes something will be bothering me and i won't say it because I know, you know, it'll, it would lead to a disagreement or something like that. Right. And it's like, I just, I don't, I don't, you know, want to have that, but it's like, my wife knows me so well. It's like, she knows when something's bothering me. Right. And so if she knows something's bothering me and she's like, what, what is it? And I'm like, oh, it's nothing. She knows that's not the case. <laughs> and then that only fuels her frustration, understandably. And then eventually I'll say what it is and we work it out. But I mean, I don't know if I, if I didn't, sort of cross that bridge, right? If I, if I kind of just stayed with, and I'm not saying this is what you do, but like just thinking of my own experience, like if I, 
if I just sort of held on to that and I just kind of said, no, 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 and, and I like I didn't share, I think that would be a major problem for her and for us because a big part of our relationship has been that we are able to, you know, talk about and talk through things and our feelings. And so, you know, again, I, I will have those moments every now and then where it's like I, I hold back, but only to a point. But if I, if I kept that, yeah, I don't know. I, it could be a different, different story. You have to pick your battles in life, but in relationships of importance, you know, personal, business, whatever, relationships of importance, you have to, you have to say what's on your mind because even if you don't say it, it's still there. It's still there and probably something else layers on top of that same thing until it's really like a, a burden or situation. Yeah, no, it is true. Now, like I said, that was, that was the last thing I really wanted to ask you about that. Uh, at least for now, we still have one more, one more part of this trilogy, but on a kind of on a, on a related note, but a little, but a little bit different. And I guess I, I like, I have to have to give you kudos for this because you do have this ability. And I think it is because everything feels so measured coming from you things feel more important when you say them and you have this ability to make things feel more important. Like I watched the videos that you guys put out on the Acme channel about, you know, new releases and stuff like that. And there was one, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago at this point, for whatever reason, this one stood out to me. I, I couldn't tell you why, because it's, you know, it was sort of like, uh, you know, like a typical Wednesday new release uh, thing. But you were talking about, uh, uh, the Batman Shadow War and how it was relevant to Dark Crisis. And you were standing there in the video in front of that wall and you were like, you got to get this. It's like, it's Batman Shadow War. You got you to get this. And I'm saying to myself, it's like, he makes me feel like I need to get this. And the thing is, and I don't, this is not, you know, this is not a knock on any creator's work. Statistically speaking, every week, all the comics that come out, <laughs> Like statistically speaking, most of them are really like not that important in the long run. Now, in fairness, you weren't even talking about the long run, right? You're talking about, look, if you're interested in Dark Crisis right now, this is this is relevant. So I, I get that. But it's just one of those things like, yeah, most of the stuff that comes out, you might not ever revisit it again. But it's like in that moment, man, you made it feel like it, it was the most important thing in the world. Batman Shadow War. I think that because I kind of felt that way. You know, as, as a retailer, it's like Shadow War. This is just, you know, buying some time with a meaningless crossover. But upon reading it and not even being a Deathstroke fan at all, I, I, that character is nothing for me. I was like, oh, something's happening here. And I got to let people know that something's happening because if I could transfer some measure of, hey, this is cool. This is a thing that's happening right now, and I want to make sure that, you know, you're a part of it. I can transfer some measure of that. That has to be a part of comics retail, in my opinion. You know, simply putting a thing on the shelf, and that is the end of your involvement with it, other than to say, that will be four ninety nine, please. Do you want a bag? Nothing in the middle. That's not it. That's not it, and that's also not sustainable because... That leads to, you know, your, your customer saying, I got a stack of books I haven't read in six months because I'm not excited about anything, even though they may have the absolute best stuff and they'll know it. That could lead to them disconnecting to, to, the, to the medium as part of their entertainment diet. So I don't say that about every book at all, but if there's something going on, I want to, A, know what that is, that I was also in the right place at the right time, because there are books that, you know, I thought about not reading. But I did read. Okay, something's going on here. When I come in on Wednesday, this person's got to read. I got to make sure I talk specifically to this person, tell them what's going on with this thing. And I think that's the that's the reader that's still in me. That's a comic book fan that's still in me. You know, I think you've asked before, like, where's the line? The line's constantly, the line's constantly moving. And I think that, well, the strength that I have as far as salesmanship, it comes off of that comic book fan, maybe. That's what that's tapping into. Moving, you know, moving some stuff around and then projecting out into the world. This is a good book. You want to make sure you get this. Yeah. Breakthrough moment. Well, you totally conveyed it in, in that sense. And I guess, I, you know, maybe because I'm like, why, why did that one stand out to me so much? I guess because like yourself, I suppose, 
I was kind of, I was a little skeptical. I too was like, oh, another crossover, right? And uh, and to hear you talk about it in that way, it was just like, oh man, you know, I, I still haven't read it, but so it, <laughs> it wasn't so wasn't totally sold. But but you're talking about it. But I am talking about it. Yeah. Now, as we sort of wind down, as high everything full circle here, you mentioned about you know if someone's read the Superman fundamentals, but they're looking for something more current, you'll you'll throw them to you know to Bendis and to Man of Steel and everything. Not the current uh, current War World stuff. That wouldn't be. Would that be in the mix? So, I'm not always right about comic stuff. Sometimes. Even I have moments of like, let me revisit this thing. War World, uh, the, the Superman story, it got Superman off of Earth to deal with War World, which is like this horrible, you know, just battle planet or fortress, you know, asteroid or whatever the thing is. It, it, it's uh, been a part of Superman comics since the late 70s, I think. Mongol you know, rules over this, this place that moves around the galaxy, just ruining storylines. But... Yeah, I've, I've never liked it. I don't like Mongol. I don't like War World. Never have. Ask Coast City how they feel about War World. Um, and it just felt like a set it and forget it kind of thing. Meaning that put Superman out there. Let's get this War World thing going. He's off of Earth. We'll let you know when it's time to wrap up. Because in my mind, it doesn't take... I don't remember how many issues it was. It was a lot of chapters of action comics, primarily where the story unfolded. It was a lot of issues. And in my mind, it does not under any circumstances of red sun or whatever. It doesn't take this long to get Mongol dealt with. It simply does not. That being said, reading the final chapter, which was like a Superman one shot, which was a little confusing to readers, but you know, that, that's fine. It got someone like me to pick it up because it was a one shot. It seemed to wrap up pretty well. It seemed to be a memorable storyline. I don't know if I'll encounter readers that give me cues to say, this is the thing you got to read. Superman on this world, this combat planet without his powers, but he can still, you know, inspire the people to maybe get out from under how this whole thing works. I don't know, but it's possible. It's very possible. I still think it was entirely too long, but I think there was something there after all. No, oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, this episode, I know, I guess I had promised last time and, uh, we had promised on social media, we would get more into what you're into when you're not at the shop. And I still want to get to that. I think that'll be the subject for our concluding, the concluding chapter of this trilogy. But well, right now, what I'm into when I leave the shop is eating something and going to sleep. All right. Well, it'll be a real short episode next month. There that's, you go. that's the nature of my life right now. And I, and, I, and I see that I see what's going on and I get like that sometimes. And it's not good, but I'm hoping that I'll have something different to say when we talk next. You know, like I said, I'm kind of reconnecting with my collection of comics I've had, you know, over, over my lifetime. Um, hoping to rediscover what my interest may very well have been or what new interest might be. I'm really trying to reinvest in that stuff. Right on. Did you, did you enjoy this recording? Was it, I know, I don't think it was what either of us expected, but did, did you enjoy it? No, no. Yeah. Uh, you'd say we're going to talk about your favorite places to eat and maybe some travel <laughs> stuff and <laughs> comics you like, what comics do you like is what, uh, is what you told me we we're going to do. And I was like, okay, what do I like? Where, where have I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have answers to these questions. What do we do? So I'm kind of glad that we went in the directions that we did, you know, hopefully it's entertaining to, to uh, to some listeners somewhere. I, I, I don't know. I feel like people don't want to hear from me about stuff, but no, that's maybe. not, that's not true. And you know, we have listeners all over the world. Uh, you know, one of the cool things with my, my, my podcast hosting provider, you know, I, I can see, uh, the audience, like where they are, where people are downloading episodes. Uh, and it's, it's really, really cool. So no, I, I really hope people enjoyed. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I love that the conversation just sort of went where it, where it wanted to go. And, you know, I was truly curious you know, to hear about the distribution side of things. Cause that's, you know, largely new information for me. I guess it's beyond, uh, my, my level of, of experience. So like that was really fascinating. And 
yeah, I think just sort of, you know, again, talking more about, about this cryptic side and, and what, you know, what it, what it could really be all about. I, I found it fascinating. I hope the audience did as well. And I, I listen, man, I thank you for, uh, for your time and, and for sharing, you know, what you did. I, I hope that unlike the Bendis Superman episode we did, I hope you didn't feel like you got squashed this time. <laughs> No, no, this is what you call a shoot interview in, in uh, wrestling terms where, you know, the wrestler goes completely off script and, you know, shoots from the hip, breaks the old kayfabe, as, as they see, the, the carnival kayfabe. Um, but no, th- this is always fun. And um, I appreciate the opportunity that, uh, that you give for me to promote Acme Comics in whatever weird way that, that I may do. You know, there's definitely more. There's more I want to do. There's more I want to do locally, um, on behalf of comics. So, I'm not done yet. If I can just get out of my own head, then the real thing begins. The sleeper must awaken. Well, I look forward to seeing all of that unfold, and I look forward to talking about it. So, next month we'll conclude the trilogy. We'll talk about those goals, and we'll talk about the personal interests uh, when when you're not at the shop and when you have bandwidth for things. Uh, but, you know, besides that. So that's that's what people can look forward to for our concluding chapter. Jermaine, thank you as always. Thank you, audience. I really do appreciate it. Make sure you check out the other shows in the Flat Squirrel Podcast Network. Jermaine and I will be back next month for the finale of our big Once and Future Lord Retail trilogy. Until then, as always, don't be a flat squirrel. Support the show and receive exclusive additional content, including my DC Movie Rewatch podcast, at patreon.com slash Anthony Desiato. Thank you to all patrons for enabling me to produce this show. Also, be sure to explore the other shows within the Flat Squirrel Podcast Network, which is home to Digging for Kryptonite, another exciting episode in The Adventures of Superman, Summoning the Zords, and My Comic Shop History, all hosted by yours truly. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Visit flatsquirrelproductions.com for more. Thank you all.